And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Stefan and his team for inviting me to this MOF conference. Indeed, it is the first conference for me in the MOF community. And uh, today I'm going to talk about MOFs as a, a heterogeneous catalyst for water splitting reactions. So before going to the topic, just I would like to go for uh, uh, what our group focuses upon. Actually, we work on crystal engineering, as Martin says, and uh, in the crystal engineering, we actually focus on the four topics. And uh, one is that the coordination polymers and uh, metal organic frameworks. And then uh, we have something like reactions in crystals. And then we have metal organic gels and uh, single and multi-component organic crystals and salts. And here we focus upon different, different properties on each. And uh, you can see that we have a, a porosity catalysis, PSM means post-synthetic modifications and uh, conductivity and sensing applications in the coordination polymers and MOFs. And here in the reactions in crystals, generally we focus upon solid state two plus two reactions and two plus two polymerizations. And uh, when we go here, metal organic gels, we look into the stability of these gels as well as uh, can we conduct some covalent reactions in these gels and then how to establish the structures of gels and can we use the gelating materials, soft materials for conductivity property or something like that and the photophysical properties. And then when it goes to this uh, organic crystal engineering, we say this uh, uh, hydrogen bonded solids and we have a multi-component uh, systems and supramolecular synthons and host guest uh, interactions and all that we explore upon. So going to the today's topic, actually today is actually what, what I said is that uh, MOFs has a electrocatalyst for water splitting reactions. So the electrocatalysis of water actually gives you the uh, hydrogen and uh, oxygen. And uh, you can see that this is the off cell reactions and uh, in, the, in the presence of base, actually it gives you this uh, water splitting produces hydrogen as well as uh, oxygen. And uh, so conversion of uh, uh, H2O to oxygen and H2, that is oxygen evolution reaction, hydrogen evolution reaction. You can say that uh, that energy storage because this H2 and O2 again, uh, yeah. Okay, so this H2 and O2 again, uh, you can do the oxidant reduction reaction and uh, H2 oxidation reaction to produce the H2O and actually you have to supply the energy from external resources here to produce this and whereas here when you do this oxygen reduction reaction as well as hydrogen oxidation reaction then you get uh, the energy backwards so you can call that as a energy conversion so these are the fuel cells actually it is given here and oxygen um, evolution reaction happens at uh, the anode whereas a hydrogen evolution ha reaction happens at the cathode so similarly the same with oxygen uh, reduction reaction and hydrogen uh, oxidation reaction and, but actually, if you look at this delta G value, the delta G value is as, uh, as high as a 237.2 kilojoules per mole for the water splitting. So these reactions are not thermodynamically favorable at standard temperature and pressure. And uh, further, actually what it requires is, for example, if your calculations tells you that you require the potential of 1.23 volts to do the water splitting, but what happens is that the reaction does not happen with 1.23 uh, volts. Uh, you require a over potential because there is an inherent uh, activa the activation of the electrodes and uh, the problems with the uh, electrodes with the solvents and all those electrolytes are there. So, and because of that, you require a over potential. And uh, so due to this over potential requirement, uh, the OER reaction is very sluggish and you require the uh, catalyst. The catalyst generally they are um, used is uh, the metals like uh, noble metals like platinum, rhodium, uh, ruthenium, and all these things they use. And uh, these metals actually uh, coordinates with the water molecule and uh, facilitates the uh, water splitting. So, but as you see that these are some of these uh, mechanisms that I'm uh, putting it here, but I'm not going in depth here. This is for oxygen evolution reaction, and this is for the hydrogen evolution reaction. So the problem here is that the people you are using it, uh, the noble metals and which are expensive and these are not viable, practically not viable. And uh, basically if you look at it, uh, el uh, water electrocatalysis looks easy and it is known for ages, but uh, see the problem is that it is very expensive and only about 0.4% of the hydrogen being produced through this uh, electrolysis of the water. But the majority of these hydrogens and uh, those things are produced through the um, 
through the hydrocarbons uh, reformation reforming and uh, hydrocarbons reforming and um, so and now we require uh, uh, the metal or uh, non noble catalyst so to reduce the cost and to do that so mops are uh, used to be uh, mops are uh, considered as a viable solution for that and because the mops are you have a robust and high crystalline uh, nature and also they have a ultra high specific uh, surface area and uh, more abundant surface active sites you have and at the same time electron transport pathways between the layers facilitates uh, the mobility of the electrons and but you have to design the mops custom designed the mops to do these reactions and uh, so the mops have to be stable at uh, alkaline and acidic conditions and at the same time you should have a uh, the mops which are hydrophilic in nature the cavities or uh, channels whatever you produce the uh, they have to be hydrophilic in nature and at the same time you should have a redox metal centers in those mops and uh, they should be amenable for uh, psm post synthetic modification and the metal should have a open sides so the open sites means actually you get the mops you get a metal organic frameworks in this metal organic frameworks if you have the metal is not fully coordinated but it has some uh, uh, solvents coordinated to it which are easy to be replaced with water molecules and those are the situations that uh, uh, facilitates this uh, water splitting reactions and actually these are the strategies that uh, we employed in our group uh, to do this uh, electrocatalysis using mops and uh, basically one can use the pristine mops and the pristine mops which are stable enough and which are hydrophilic and uh, at the same time they have a, a redox metal centers and also the doping of the redox metal active centers basically we have a stable mop but if we don't have a redox active centers in that mop then we can take the redox active metal salt and we can dope with the with the metal salt and use those things for the water splitting reactions and then you have a, an unstable mop and these unstable mops can be carbonized to produce the graphitic materials which are embedded by the metal atoms and all that and you can use those materials for this oer and her as well as actually here we have shown that these carbonized materials are useful for oer her as well as overall water splitting reaction so we call this as a bifunctional materials and actually here also we have an unstable mop and these two belongs to the unstable mops actually here too what we do did is that we got a, a mop which is unstable in basic conditions and then uh, we have in situ grown the mop on the nickel foam and we could establish that these mops can uh, in situ grown mop is good enough to do the oer hr and overall water splitting so moving to this pristine mops case and actually we are were working on this uh, to produce these two mops so that means this ligand l and ta can give you uh, a mop and similarly the difference between uh, this one and this one is that you can see that uh, it is having an nh2 group here and this does not have an nh2 group so nothing but both are tartaric acids but one is having an nh2 and the other does not have the nh2 group and when we treat this two uh, combination of l and ta and l and nh2 ta we got these two mops here and you can see the formulas there is a small difference here in the ta mop you have a 5 h2o whereas here you have a dmf and a h2o there and then what happens is that they form the isostructural uh, uh, mops and but they are the two dimensional networks these two dimensional networks stack on each other to form the channels and in the channels what we have is the water molecules and uh, the continuous chains of water molecules are occupied in the channels so this is because you have uh, the carboxylate ions and the oxygen uh, either oxygen atoms and all that they have hydrogen bonded within the channel these water molecules and here too you have an additional uh, uh, linkers like nh2 group that forms the water molecule uh, hydrogen bonds with water molecules so then we did uh, uh, study the uh, electrocatalysis of these mops and that is because we have seen that these mops are good enough to absorb the water sorption means water vapors and if you look at these water sorption values what we found is that uh, the uh, tm of has the better uh, water sorption ability and h2 tm of has the better sorption ability than the tm of and uh, so this is about the co2 absorption and we found that this is also good enough to absorb the co2 so now actually when we go for this electrochemical uh, 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 studies what do we do is that we do the four sorts of uh, four uh, uh, graphs that i have shown here yeah so here 
So, sorry, yeah. So once, first of all, we have to see the CV and see that your uh, MOF is electrochemically active or not. And you can see that here, the uh, both the MOFs are electrochemically active. And then the next, you could record the LSV, linear sweep voltammetry, and that gives you that at a certain potential, it gives you a current here, an onset potential. And you can see that the red curve is belongs to the NH2 TMOF, and both are uh, generating the current at this potential, but there is a difference in the potential that you have to apply. For example, if you take uh, the TMOF, you require 1.61 volts to produce that current, whereas uh, NH2 TMOF one, with 1 1.58 volts itself, it can do that. And based on that, you can see that if you subtract these values from 1.23, that is the ideal value, what you see is that there is a 356 electron volts is required to generate the current of 1 milli ampere, uh, 1 milli ampere cent per centimeter square in for NH2 TM off, whereas that value is higher for a TM off. So, and the Tuffel slope is another one, and uh, the Tuffel slope actually tells you that. Uh, how much potential or potential one required uh, to increase this reaction kinetics by tenfold. And if you look at this, this is the IRO2 is that uh, benchmark catalyst. And the benchmark catalyst requires 80 millivolts per decade, whereas the I'm giving you here for an H2TM of, it requires about 105 um, millivolts per decade. And this is actually chrono uh, ampermetry study. And it shows that uh, actually the material is stable up to uh, 12,000 seconds. So this is that, and uh, I'm moving to the other one. And there I added the NH2 group and I, uh, we looked into it, how the NH2 group can influence these uh, properties of water splitting. And here actually we have introduced these uh, uh, immutable moieties here and how these immutable moieties actually can influence your electrochemical activities. Basically, immutable moieties are introduced there to increase the hydrophilicity of the MOF. And uh, so we have, have a combination of L1 and TA and L2 TA MOFs. And not only that, here we have studied the series of MOFs and where we have uh, uh, three metal salts with a different uh, electrochemical uh, reduction potentials. Uh, redox potential with the different redox potentials. Basically what we have is that if we take this one, L1, and this is the one four substituted and L3 is the one, well, L2 is the one three substituted. And we could get a two dimensional network, something like this, a rectangular grid network. And whereas when we go for the other one, actually it takes the one more ligand here and given this uh, kind of a curvature that can generate here, it forms an M2L2 macrocycles here. So you can see there is a one dimensional chain here. This one dimensional chain contains M2L2 macrocycles, which are linked by the your tartalic acid moieties. So basically in essence, this is also a two dimensional network. This is also a two dimensional network. So whereas this two dimensional network is doubly interpenetrated, but this is not the case. And another interesting difference between this is that, so we have, one open metal site here, there is a water coordination there. And uh, whereas here, the metal is fully coordinated by the ligands. So on top of that, we have a, a cobalt and nickel and which have a different uh, redox potentials. So how do they uh, perform in this electrochemical analysis? And before that, we want to prepare the copper moff also so that we can compare with the nickel, cobalt and uh, uh, copper. And uh, so, but we could not get the single crystals with a copper salt. And uh, what did we do is that we took the cobalt MOFs and just immersed into this uh, DMF solution of uh, ethanolic solution of uh, copper nitrates. And we could get this uh, copper MOFs also of the same. But what we found is that the cell parameters are totally different and we could not get the crystal structures of these copper MOFs. And we could index to get the cell parameters just to say that the materials are crystalline. And uh, so now when we do these electrochemical studies, what you can, what you see here is that, so we have uh, uh, a nickel MOF that is actually, if you look at these redox potentials, so the order is that it goes, increases with the redox potentials increases from nickel to the cobalt two plus. And similarly, what we see here is that that is also the same case here. And the nickel MOF shows the uh, better, uh, uh, or potential compared to the other two ones. And at the same time, the one that is having the open metal site, so that is the two is having a, requires the less or potential to do the OER reaction. And similarly, when we looked into this reaction kinetics and uh, you can see that uh, 
uh, IRO2 is here and the benchmark product at least this is having a 100.47 uh, millivolts per decade. So whereas this is uh, the ones that we have prepared with nickel and this is also comparable to the one that we have produced. So then I have given you the pristine mops, how these pristine mops can be used for the ultracatalysis. And here we have produced actually one mop here. And uh, actually this is done by the Kartik uh, when he was a PhD student with me. And now he is here sitting in the audience. And uh, here what we have is uh, we have this molecule that is containing the amide moieties here. This amide moieties produces provides the uh, required hydrophilicity to the MOF cavities, whatever it is. And this one we are uh, treating with the fumarate with cadmium, cadmium nitrate. So when we do this reaction, interestingly, what we found is that uh, there is a five connected net that forms here. And this five connected net, actually you can see that uh, there is a trigonal bipyramid uh, structure uh, coordination that is found by the cadmium. And it goes to a two dimensional, three dimensional network like this a 3D hexagonal network that is being formed. And this can be likened to the boron nitride network. You can see hexagonal boron nitride here, boron and nitrogen, all of them are connect, five connected. In the similar fashion, this is also five connected. And uh, apart from that, what we have is that there are, because given these uh, uh, channels or cavities, whatever it is, they are bigger and uh, they are double interpenetrated to give you that. And not only just double interpenetrated, so now the connector is that diamide molecule, what we have here. So the linker also acts as a guest and this forms uh, just goes there and incorporates in these channels that are being formed. And you can see that between the linkers, there are no interactions. So the nitrogens are a kind of an naked one. So then we thought that we can dope this material with cobalt because the cobalt is redox active and the cadmium is not so. So when we do that, actually we got a COCD BNN and that was characterized by different techniques and we have seen the photo diffraction and the photo diffraction remains constant, no change much. And uh, also we have seen the IR and IR is also similar. And, but when we go for the DRS and what we can see is that there is a new peak that is being generated at a 520 nanometers and that corresponds to the CO nitrogen interaction. And the solid state luminescence also, it, you can see that there is a quenching of luminescence intensity in COCD BNN compared to the other one, CD BNN. So these are the characterizations and uh, it shows that actually the um, uh, cadmium to cobalt, uh, yeah, cadmium to cobalt is a uh, ratio is 2.54 to one. So these are the electrochemical studies that we performed. And uh, what we found here is that, um, so you can see that this is actually COCD BNN and it is uh, very active, whereas uh, CD BNN is not redox active. And at the same time, you can see that uh, uh, the COCD BNN is, uh, gives you uh, or poten uh, current here with uh, potential of something like 1.54 or 1.6 somewhere. And at the same time, the same potential, same current is observed even after 1000 cycles. And also it shows that the uh, uh, kinetics, reaction kinetics is as good as the benchmark catalyst, uh, IRO2 from the Tafel slow. And also you can see there is a constant generation of the uh, current uh, at the time or at the time and up to the time interval of 18,000 seconds there. So now actually I am going to the carbonization network that whatever we have here, and we have a tetracarboxylic acid here. This tetracarboxylic acid, when we treat with cobalt nitrate and do the solo thermal reaction, we get a three-dimensional MOF. So unfortunately, this three-dimensional MOF, we found it to be unstable in the basic conditions. And then, um, so Karabi is the one and uh, who is, a, he, she was a former student of us, mine. And then she thought that she can carbonize it and produce a graphitic carbon. And uh, so at 80 degrees Celsius and argon, she uh, do the carbonization and she could produce cobalt nanoparticles embedded and doped porous carbon. So these are the characterizations what we have and you can see the optical uh, image of the crystals that are being produced. And this is the FSM image and this is after carbonization. And uh, so this is about HRTM images of uh, uh, cobalt nanoparticle that, that are embedded. And you can see that this is the cobalt nanoparticle, which is embedded by the graphite. You can see the, uh, the interfringes distances are different and this interfringe distance 
belongs to the cobalt, whereas the, the other one belongs to the uh, graphitic carbons. And similarly, a CAD pattern shows that the material is crystalline. And uh, you can see that uh, we have this XPS analysis and XPS analysis shows that uh, we have a cobalt zero, that is a nanoparticle. And also there is a, I, a Raman spectra also shows that there is a graphitic carbon as well as a defective carbon. And uh, these uh, the ratio between ID by IG is 1.03. So basically the defects, the ratio, the defects are important and uh, to make, uh, to get the more active sites uh, in the material. And uh, so we did uh, do the electrochemical studies and we uh, see that and it requires about 360 uh, millivolts or potential to drive the current density of 10 milliampere per centimeter square. And this is the probable mechanism. And here too, you can see that this material is very stable. The current is produced linearly up to 18,000 seconds and without any change. And if you look at this uh, Tuffel slope and uh, you can see that the Tuffel slope of uh, uh, our material is much better than the benchmark uh, material that is IR over to there. So not only OER, and we found that this is also good enough to do the HER, hydrogen evaluation reaction. And in the hydrogen evaluation reaction, what do you see is that um, we ca you can see that they are uh, red X active as well as uh, the HER or potential required here is 325 millivolts to produce 10 milliampere centimeter square current. And uh, then uh, you have a tuple slope of 117 millivolts for a decade. And then uh, this is also, uh, you can, uh, see it here and this is uh, not close as to the uh, benchmark catalyst platinum carbon it is much uh, lower than that much higher than that so and similarly you have a uh, overall water splitting also we did perform with the two electrode system and in these two electrodes actually we took a graphitic carbon and then the graphitic electrode and then uh, we coated those things with uh, the material and uh, basically that uh, two electrode system and then we did this overall water splitting reaction and it shows you that, uh, sorry. Yeah, you require about 1.6 uh, 6 volts to drive the current density of 10 milliampere centimeter square and to produce the hydrogen. And this is the final one, what I want to show you here. And uh, we have uh, this ligand design and here too you have the amide functional groups and a tetracarboxylic acid. So when we treat with manganese acetate, uh, we got this morph and this morph is having a diamond diode architecture. And in this diamond diode architecture, you have uh, these SBUs and uh, these, SB, these diamond diode uh, networks are uh, doubly interpenetrated and uh, this doubly interpenetrated network and what we found is unstable in the basic conditions. And, uh, but what we found is that this, the same network can be grown in situ by keeping the uh, uh, a nickel foam, uh, strip of a nickel foam in the uh, reaction flask. So this is what that is being shown and uh, the morph was in situ grown on the uh, nickel foam here. This is the nickel foam uh, uh, morph that is grown on the nickel foam. And this is about the FSM image of that. And this is actually bare nickel foam. What you see is that uh, you have a hollow structure for the bare nickel foam. And when we do this uh, in situ grown the morph on the uh, nickel foam, you can see that the crystals of the morph are grown on the uh, nickel foam. So the, we characterized with uh, the powder X-ray as well as um, uh, EDX analysis and then the spectroscopy, these uh, images, microscopic images. And uh, so they show you that there is a uniform distribution of all the elements that are involved in this and also gives you the proportion of the elements that are present. And uh, you can also see that uh, the in situ grown morph, MN morph, has the same pattern as the actual MN morph. Okay. And uh, so, further, what we see is that the XPS analysis and the XPS analysis, this is the full spectrum, surface spectrum of XPS analysis. And uh, it shows that there is a nickel plus two is generated here in this uh, uh, in situ grown uh, strip. And in this, this uh, Nickel plus two is being generated because of the uh, presence of this MN CS3, uh, MN acetate, manganese acetate. And at the same time, there is a nickel zero is also present and as well as uh, the MN two plus also are present basically. So, and at the same time, there is a synergic interaction that happens between this MN two plus and a nickel zero that is there in the, uh, on the strip. 
and what we found is that there is a shift in these uh, values here in binding energies you can see that mn uh, 2p3 by 2 by 1.8 electron volts and uh, mn 2p by 1.6 electron volts it is actually these are the uh, there is a shifting in the binding energies was observed here and uh, this we feel that this is because of the electron transfer between mn plus 2 to and nickel plus 2 so and not only that we did this um, uh, experts uh, oons uh, um, spectra here that is being uh, pro projected here and what you see is that uh, uh, this is the uh, oxygen vacancy here and this is the oxygen uh, spectra here and we could see that the ratio between oxygen vacancy and oxygen is 63.20 that makes the material perfect for this kind of uh, electrocatalytic studies and whereas if you take uh, uh, just uh, MN morph without nickel form, what we see is that the ratio is as low as 38.95%. And this is not good for the studies. And uh, this is being calculated like this. And so these are the electrochemical studies. And uh, that tells you that MN morph nickel form uh, actually requires 280 millivolts uh, uh, or potential to generate 20, uh, 20 milliampere centimeter square current. And uh, so, whereas if you look at IRO2, that is the benchmark electrocatalyst that requires about 320 millivolts, and this one is better than the benchmark catalyst. And at the same time, you can see that up to the uh, 10,000 uh, seconds, and uh, there is a constant current being produced by the chrono ampermetric studies. You can see that. And also, the reaction kinetics, you can see these are the better than the uh, the benchmark catalyst. Uh, actually, this is benchmark catalyst is uh, having, uh, no, sorry, we didn't put here. We have a bare nano, uh, this nickel foam, and bare nickel foam requires 94 millivolts per decade. And whereas uh, this manganese MN morph requires about 80 millivolts per decade. Yeah. So, and then, uh, yeah, this is actually, we have seen that, that. Um, Yeah, that is the CV of that, that. So similarly, we could see that this material is good enough for, uh, for HER also. And uh, for HER also, it requires uh, the power potential about 113 millivolts per millivolt, 113 millivolts per decade. And then, uh, so these are the uh, corresponding electrochemical study costs there. And this is the one that, uh, uh, designed uh, electrochemical setup, what we have here. This is for overall water splitting reaction. So basically it is a bifunctional catalyst. We have shown OER separately and HER separately and as well as uh, both the, thing, both the uh, things together. And uh, here the strips were coated with, uh, uh, sorry. So, yeah. So, and we have a two electrode system with two electrode system. We could show that this is, can do the overall water splitting reaction also. And uh, so it requires about a cell voltage of 1.68 volts to drive a current density of 10 milliampere centimeter square, and uh, which is uh, 190 millivolts lower than the uh, benchmark uh, catalyst, IRO2. So actually what I have presented so far is that uh, one can use the pristine MOFs uh, if the MOFs contain the red axis metal centers and at the same time, uh, the MOFs, MOFs are stable at the uh, basic conditions and, uh, and also they have to have a hydrophilicity. And if the MOFs are not red axis active, then one can dope the red axis metal center into it and do the electrochemical studies. And uh, the third one, we did look into that, uh, one can do the carbonization of the MOFs and uh, utilize them for these electrochemical studies. And the fourth one is about uh, uh, getting a support to the unstable MOF to do the electrochemical studies. So uh, recently there is a review article we have written in the ChemCom, one can go through that. And at the same time, uh, uh, this is a special issue uh, VSI that uh, virtual special issue uh, was uh, guest edited on this uh, topic. And uh, whoever is interested, they can browse through it. And finally, uh, thanks to all my students and also the uh, funding agencies, CERB and DST and DST Fist. And for electrochemical studies, we collaborate with uh, Professor D. Pradhan from Material Science Department. So thank you all for your questions.